We talked about the Black Horsemen of Revelation 6 in our videos before. In fact, we did this video about the Locusts which connected the Black Horsemen to the Locusts of Revelation 9. I hope you watched this video by now, as I still stand behind what this video said 100%. This video is going to focus on just one aspect of the Black Horseman, the scales in his hands. Let's read it now. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Other teachers on the third horseman, myself included, note how this third horseman will bring on some kind of a food scarcity or famine. The measuring of food with scales sounds exactly like the rationing of food. Now this isn't just a straight up interpretation, since Jesus describes this about the beginning of end times in Matthew 24. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So Jesus describes famines in the beginning of sorrows. It's a solid interpretation of the Black Horseman. And we know from this video that the Black Horseman is connected to the locust of Revelation 9. And those locusts will also fall into the first woe of Revelation. So a food shortage in the world begins to take shape at the beginning of end times. And by the way, I've told you in all my videos to prepare for this by storing up food and water. I pray you've done so by now. But one thing I didn't hyper-focus on in my videos is the rider of the black horse had scales in his hand. Now these scales could be said to symbolically measure out the wheat and barley involved in the rationing of food. But scales also symbolizes something else in the Bible. We can find a good example of scales being used in the book of Ezekiel. Let's read this from chapter 45 about the temple in his vision. Thus says the Lord God, Enough, O princes of Israel, remove violence and plundering, execute justice and righteousness, and stop dispossessing my people, says the Lord God. You shall have honest scales, an honest ephah, and an honest bath. In this vision about the future temple, God demands no more violence and plundering of people. There shall be justice and righteousness in stopping the dispossession of God's people. And all this is symbolized with honest scales. You have to know that Ezekiel's time was the time of the Israelites' exile, and God was preparing for end times through his prophets like Daniel, Zechariah, and Ezekiel. This mention of honest scales in this temple is a direct correlation to the message of the end times. I did this video about the theory of Ezekiel's temple. I believe Ezekiel saw a vision of the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we Christians are the third temple of God, the body of Christ. So honest scales being used in Ezekiel's temple was not just an instruction to the prince of the temple, but us as well. Having honest scales with proper judgment was something God has talked about before. You should do no injustice in judgment, in measure of length, weight, or volume. You shall have honest scales, honest weights, an honest ephah, and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Leviticus was in the time of Moses, while God's laws were given to the people on Mount Sinai. So honest scales being used at this time is a key part of God's instruction at the start of his people. Solomon also said this in a proverb from the time of the kings. Honest weights and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in his bag are his work. You should realize how honest weights and scales in measuring our actions would be an important trait for God's people back then and also for all of us Christians nowadays. And conversely, God says this about dishonest scales in the Bible. Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. A cunning Canaanite, deceitful scales are in his hand. He loves to oppress. Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, in the short measure that is an abomination? Shall I count pure those with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? Time and time again, God talks about the need for honesty with references to honest scales. And dishonesty was also connected to deceitful measurements symbolized by scales. Okay, this is an obvious point. Of course, honesty in our dealings would be important to God with regards to proper judgment. But let's go back to Ezekiel 45. 
and read more of that chapter from God. Thus says the Lord God, Enough, O princes of Israel, remove violence and plundering, execute justice and righteousness, and stop dispossessing my people, says the Lord God. You shall have honest scales, an honest ephah, and an honest bath. The ephah and the bath shall be of the same measure, so that the bath contains one-tenth of a homer, and the ephah one-tenth of a homer. Their measure shall be according to the homer. The shekel shall be twenty geras, twenty shekels, twenty-five shekels, and fifteen shekels shall be your mina. This is the offering which you shall offer. You shall give one-sixth of an ephah from a homer of wheat, and one-sixth of an ephah from a homer of barley. Now, this passage is enlarged from the command of honest scales to an offering of wheat and barley. Note how both the measurements of wheat and barley are the same. One-sixth of an ephah for both wheat and barley. Honest scales leads to a direct offering of equal measurements from the wheat and the barley. Now we'll reconfigure the slide to compare Ezekiel's honest scales with Revelation 6 and the scales of the black horseman. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked and behold a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So Ezekiel has honest scales with both wheat and barley measuring the same in the offering, but the black horseman has scales in his hands with wheat and barley being unequal in their measurement. Maybe Revelation 6 is talking about more than the rationing of food. Maybe this is talking more broadly about dishonesty itself. And if the scales being a measure of honesty are the key to this, then I think the third horseman on the black horse is going to reveal dishonesty in the world. Since we've connected the black horseman with the locust of Revelation 9, and if you've watched the locust video, you'll know we pinpointed one particular politician who might be possessed by the leader of the locust. I know, newsflash, a politician would be dishonest. I'm not breaking any new ground here. Unless the dishonesty is really big, and we would only know about it if it was revealed to the world. The leader of the locust in Revelation 9 is an angel named Abaddon, which means destruction. Maybe the dishonesty will be so big that it'll bring destruction in a large manner. And I'll give you the spoiler alert for the locust video. The world leader that is possessed by Abaddon would be Joe Biden, the President of the United States. I know there are many that doubt that an elderly man who's clearly suffering from the beginnings of senility could be a key person in regards to fulfilling biblical prophecy. I personally think it's persuasive that Abaddon would be spelled in Hebrew exactly the same as the name Biden. But besides the interpretation we've gone over in the Locust video, could there be anything else that connects Biden and the destruction from Abaddon in the Bible? I give you the Gospel of John. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he had found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he had said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us, since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple, and the Jews told him that it had taken forty-six years to build it so far. Did you catch the connection? We'll make room for it. The leader of the locusts is Abaddon, which means destruction. That name Abaddon is spelled the same as Biden in Hebrew. And Joe Biden is the 46th president of the United States. Whoa. Both the locusts and the temple during Jesus' time are talking about destruction using the number 46. I don't think that's a coincidence. And if that's on purpose, then we should see a little foreshadow of this connection with the locust and the black horseman with scales. The book of Amos is largely about social justice and righteousness with God holding people accountable under judgment. You can see meaning behind some of Jesus' rebukes of the Pharisees for not learning the lessons from the prophet Amos. 
The book of Amos is a good book to study to understand the deeper lessons of community and caring for each other. I went over a similar lesson in this Good Samaritan video. These are really good lessons for all of us Christians as we approach the end times. Let's read Amos chapter 8. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end is come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain? and the Sabbath, that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit. This passage speaks about the needy and the poor of the land being swallowed up with falsifying the scales by deceit. See how the scales are used with deceit? And this passage also describes many dead bodies everywhere. This is going to turn out to be another parallel to Revelation, because after the black horseman with the scales... We await the fiery red horseman to ride. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. People are going to be killing each other, dead bodies everywhere, just like an Amos after its falsified scales. Now, do you think the parallel of Amos is a little weak in the connection to the book of Revelation? So they both have scales and dead bodies, but is the connection more firm than that? Oh yeah, it sure is. Revelation starts with a black horseman who has scales with an imbalance of wheat and barley. Scales in the Bible were a measure of honesty, and in Ezekiel's temple, wheat and barley are supposed to be equal in their measurements. I think the black horseman is going to reveal some kind of measure of dishonesty from the government of the United States. We've connected the Black Horseman with the Locust of Revelation 9, and they are clearly labeled as the first woe of Revelation. That will lead to the next rider of the apocalypse, the one on the fiery red horse, who brings conflict and people killing each other. This leads to the rest of Revelation. Well, we just read from chapter 8 of Amos, the one with the deceitful scales that swallowed up the poor and the needy. That chapter is the fourth of five visions of Amos. Here are the visions. The first two visions are listed in chapter 7, with the first vision being about locust and the second vision being about conflict by fire. Wow! Completely matching the events of Revelation. It looks like the book of Amos was a foreshadow of Revelation. The time of Amos was in the time of Jonah. God was already preparing for the gospel to go to the Gentiles at this point in history. There are going to be big changes in our world. It's time to prepare. I think the scales in the hands of the black horseman with an imbalanced measure of wheat and barley means dishonesty will be revealed in some way. That's why in Ezekiel's temple, the measure of wheat and barley are the same in a passage labeled with honest scales. Make sure you have honest scales in how you treat others and demand that from your leaders as well. Read the book of Amos and learn the lessons of a people astray from God for its lack of social justice. And see how Jesus used the rebuke of the Pharisees who did not learn from the time of Amos. They're in the teachings of Jesus Christ. We'll go back and summarize the book of Amos and its social justice message to show its hermeneutic message to us. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Therefore the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, so the Lord God of hosts will be with you, as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. Afflicting the just and taking bribes? Does that sound like any politician we know? And look at this line about the prudent keeping silent, for it is an evil time. God is condemning not only the taking of bribes, but also the people who keep silent about it too. It could be said much of Washington, D.C. is either on the take or knows about it and keeps silent about it. How do you think all the politicians come out much richer than they went in? I think this written by Amos some 2,600 years ago could also be said about today.
Then in the middle of Amos's visions comes this answer from God. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north to the east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. God was going to send a famine on hearing the words of the Lord. It's no coincidence that in the 1960s, public prayer was taken out of the schools in the United States. In an obscure sentence from 200 years ago, the separation of church and state became a legal linchpin for arguing against the word of God. There is no separation of church and state in the Constitution of the United States. But that's what the forces of darkness has led us to think. We've become a godless government because that's what God has decreed for us. Just like he said in the time of Amos. This is paralleling again. Let's go to the last vision of Amos. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorposts, that the thresholds may shake, and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search them and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. Just read this setup. God is going to command the serpent to bite them, and they'll go into captivity by the sword to slay them. God will set his eyes on them for harm and not for good. Remember, the fiery red horseman is going to bring conflict, taking peace from the world with killing, and he'll be given a great sword. Again, another parallel from Amos to the end times in Revelation. This was all a setup for the ultimate connection between the book of Amos and the book of Acts. In Acts 15, the disciples of Jesus are speaking about the gospel of Jesus going to the Gentiles, and James quotes from the book of Amos. God was going to send a famine on the people of hearing the word of God, then destruction from the sword, but then God will rebuild the tabernacle of David to the Gentiles, who are called by God. The connection to Amos was noticed by James at the council in Jerusalem by the early Christian leaders. The book of Acts had already stressed the ideal community with the early Christians. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there any one among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of things that they were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. No, this is not endorsing communism, socialism, or any godless governmental structure. It's always been about your heart. But this ideal community in Acts was a direct inverse answer to the lack of social justice described in the time of Amos with its falsified scales. It's unmistakable when you compare the community in Acts 4 to the social justice problems in the book of Amos. The book of Acts starts with a lesson about Amos, then quotes directly from Amos when the gospel goes to the Gentiles at the beginning of the church. The point against a modern governmental structure comes from this. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, as the apostles cared for the community. Jesus always has to be at the center of any righteous structure, because Jesus Christ has the words of life and has already defeated death by his resurrection. That's why the apostles cared for the community. And great grace was upon them all. Amen. And we're going to need to embrace this lesson of community as the Great Tribulation approaches, when the Antichrist controls everything in the world. The dishonest scales of the Black Horseman will be revealed, but that will only bring the Great Sword and killing from the fiery red horse of Revelation 6. I believe that time is coming soon. It's time to repent and accept the grace offered by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By the end of the Tribulation, it'll be too late to repent. And may God bless all my brothers and sisters in Christ the community of God.